Hello everyone and welcome to the Soilworks Midas webinar. Um, my name is Adam McCain, I'm going to start in a few moments so if you'd like to raise a few hands and place some comments in the, the dialogue box I'd be very appreciative. Okay. I'll start in about 20 or 30 seconds time, make sure everybody's got a few more people joining. So. Okay, I've seen a few hands raised and I've also seen some comments placed in the the dialog box, so thank you very much. I'll just start again. So, welcome to the Midas Soilworks presentation for soil structure interaction analysis for an excavation with retaining wall and adjacent structures. My name is Adam Kane and I am one of the technical support engineers at Midas UK based in Hammersmith. Uh, our details are on the screen there, so if you do want to contact us, if you are having any problems, then please do phone now and we'll be able to resolve it. So just go through some of the general housekeeping rules. I'm sure you've all, or most of you, have attended before, so you'll understand what we're talking about. So what we, if you can't hear me, then your computer might be set to mute or it'll be set on a very low level, if it's muffled or anything like that. If you like to uh, maximise the screen, you just click on the, the double boxes up in the top right hand corner and if your screensaver happens to go blank then it's more than likely that your screensaver is set to on so if you want to set that to off or please do wiggle your mouse and it, I'm sure your screen will react itself. Okay, just using the go to webinar dialog box as you can see the red arrow indicated on the screen there if you click that then it will minute the screen down to a thin strip if you'd like to place your comments or questions in the chat box we've got a technical support engineer on standby who will answer any of your questions immediately and if we can't answer them within the session then we will answer them during emails at the end after so just go through the contents, we'll give you a general introduction, then we'll look at the excavation support systems, earth pressures and then the numerical axis where we'll give you a demonstration. So just give you a brief introduction to what we're going to talk about today. I'm just going to read through this. So an earth retaining system withstands lateral forces exerted by a vertical or near vertical surface in natural ground or fill. I'm sure you've seen examples of this in industry or in examples that you've worked on. Um, structural systems include walls, props, floor slabs or ground anchors. Excuse me. And soil structure interaction analysis is important for ground supported by structures as the soil generates the load as well as provide resistance to the load as well. So the SSI considers interaction of stiffness and deformation between structure and soil for an adequate assessment of stresses, forces and bending moments in the supporting structures. So that's basically your analysis being taken care of. Just want to give you an introduction to the different types. So a stone wall or stone walls is a gravity type retaining wall. Um, you can also have gabion baskets which could be stacked up against a, a face and uh, an angle. So that creates a, a gravity retaining wall as well. You've got uh, reinforced concrete retaining walls where you have to excavate a lot of material. And this is also entwined so that you actually, when you excavate, then it will have to go off at a slope angle. This will enable you to actually create the reinforced concrete retaining wall and then embed the material back in. The next step, or the next one, sorry, is steel sheet piles where you can embed the sheet pile down into the ground and then excavate the, the material after along the face. You've also got uh, propped or anchored counterlever walls as well. Uh, a rock or counterlever wall uh, which is box, pile, uh, box piles and sea camp piles be created. You can also have it if you're having anchored back as well. I've seen a lot of walls where you've actually had the member driven into the ground and then once you've excavated the material to hinder the overturning moment you actually put an anchor in or a rock bolt. So The next one is uh, piles with intermediate panels and diaphragm walls so kind of like a, a H section where you put the actual the, the concrete blocks in between a bit like Lego or Jenga if you're going to build them up. 
So we're just going to look at the excavation support system, so diaphragms or slurry walls. Uh, just give you some of the advantages and the limitations of each one. So you can construct them before the excavation and below the groundwater table or level, groundwater level. Uh, they're suitable for most soils. They relatively, have relatively high stiffness and they can become part of the permanent wall structure as well. Uh, some of the limitations of the diaphragm uh, wall are large volumes of spoil and disposal of surrey and it's, it's also a costly, um, costly process to carry out. Uh, you have to have, take caution when adjacent to shallow spread footings as well so if you undermine them you can create cracking or even failure. Uh, sheep pile walls uh, which can be constructed before the excavation is carried out and then can be placed below the, the groundwater level. Uh, you can use it in soft to medium stiff soils, obviously anything looser than that then it won't hold in place and uh, an overturning moment will make it fail. Uh, quick placement and removal, and so it makes it very cost effective. Well, I say cost effective, you've still got to use big plants to actually put it in place, but you can remove them so there's no wastage of steel. Uh, there's a, that comes with the limited initial cost as well. So no driving through th fields because obviously the pockets and everything are unpredictable and also boulders as well because they can get in the way and create the actual pile to bend uh, in the ground and this, these deformations become very troublesome when you're trying to remove the pile as well. Uh, vibrations and noise that are created in high density areas or urban areas are a major problem or a major factor because if you are going to be using them in a, in a in a situation where you're dealing with old masonry structures or listed buildings then it can sometimes shake them apart. Uh, joint sealing, another problem if it's not sealed effectively and you are starting to hold back large volumes of water or groundwater flow if it's uh, they're not if they're not overlapped efficiently then you are going to get it into the dig or into the excavated area that you're actually working in. Um, and there's also possibly large lateral movements because you're actually displacing the soils it's being put down through. So soldier piles and lagging walls, um, low initial cost, easy construction, um, but the lagging cannot be stilled uh, below groundwater level, and it's all, they're also not suitable in soils with uh, base instability. So a few more examples, you've got the examples from the first one, you can see all the soldier piles, you can see the sheet pile wall there, just to go through them as we've already covered them previously. And you see from the soldier pile wall where they're actually they're lapsed down, and that's the reason why you can't use it below groundwater level because you have to carry out the installation of the actual soldiers going all the way down the wall. I just go through seizure walls and tangent pile walls. So the advantages of them: uh, constructed before excavation and below the groundwater level, uh, they've got low vibration, low noise because they're often drilled out before you actually place the pile, and then fill the, the pile with grout and also the gevy bar or the reinforcement bar that goes down through the middle of them. Uh, wide, wide flange beams for the reinforcement as well so you can mix up the actual construction type. Uh, limitations. Uh, equipment cannot penetrate boulders. Pre-drilling is required. I've known it where you can even get the drill stuck as well so that often cause a problem when you need the pile to be put in place and they're, they're very hard to get back out again. Of waste a lot of time. Uh, micro pile walls uh, constructed before excavation is carried out and below the groundwater level. Useful under restricted space as well because obviously the machinery you're using can fit in very tight spaces as you can see from the diagram down at the bottom here down in this picture. So you can see the small machinery driving the piles. Uh, a large number are required so it does can take a, a large volume of time especially with movement of materials across the site. Uh, continuity is also a problem and place them next to each other and you get low bending resistance so they're not going to be able to hold back as a, a massive amount of materials uh, most other forms of pile driving. Right so tie back supported walls reduced depth of the structure below the trench so in tying them back as you can excavate and also drive the the ground anchors or rock bolts as you're going down through the dig. Uh, clear overhead space so you don't have to worry about the props which are shown in and all the struts which are shown in the picture down on the bottom right hand side. Uh, you cannot ins install below the groundwater level because, well let's face it, if you've got saturated material then your pull out strength isn't going to be fantastic. You're going to have, have major problems there. Easements required if outside of property limitations which I've discussed in the last webinar 
which is the when you step over into private land, which is the party wall act. So you can actually. I found it where if you have ground anchors and we had tendons which were only four meters long and we only had five meters until it was underneath the the person's property in their basement so we had to restrict them to that length and make sure that our pull out tests that we carried out were up to the correct standard for the design so that brought on several tests to be carried out so initial struts supporting the wall which we can see here uh, some of the advantage does not extend beyond the excavation wall and reduces the depth of the wall as well obviously the restriction you've got no overhead and lateral you've got overhead and lateral obstructions this means that any dig that's going to take place or excavation further to, to further extents than you are could be very costly and very time consuming um, it interferes with the vertical supports for wide spans as well so just going on to earth pressures so when the wall move, movement occurs either due to the application of surcharge loads or the loss of lateral soil support on one side due to excavation the initial state of geostatic equilibrium in the soil is disrupt disrupted so that means that obviously if you're excavating down one side then an overturning moment is going to be created with a force so the soil is divided into active and passive zones depending on the direction of the wall movement in the active zone soil thrust on the wall is minimum as the soil is under tension which is because soil does not take tensile loads very well on the on the other hand thrust on the wall is maximum in the passive zone or the overturning zone um, expressions here rep on the uh, on the slide represent the formulate for initial stress ratio for normally and over consolidated soils in and expressions on the right represent lateral loads for active and passive zones so if you look on the slide as I'm just indicating here uh, passive earth pressure coefficient KP is greater than active earth pressure coefficient KA uh, Tazaki and Beck came up with earth pre pressure diagrams to solve the problem of retaining structures through statics and uh, by the means of earth pressure diagrams as well so as you can see expressed on the screen. Earth pressure diagrams are an analytical way to calculate wall movements by solving equilibrium equations by hand. They can be useful for shallow depths and similar applications. So just going through the design process, a major difference between conventional methods and numerical analysis is the application of earth pressures onto the wall. So conventional methods input parameters manually calculate earth pressures so are you by hand just using the the coefficients uh, the application of earth pressure to walls um, and suitable for shallow excavations uh, the numerical analysis output results creates finite element mesh and assigns contuitive models to the soil so taking in all of the actual soil parameters through the modulus of elasticity and uh, software automatically calculates stresses, strains, forces in the structural elements and also the soils as well, so forces in the soils. You can extract the results for the earth pressure and you find which and it's suitable for shallow and deep excavations. So the distinct difference between the two is the earth pressure in the conventional method you have to calculate primarily before you actually carry out the analysis and everything else and then your design for the numerical analysis then it's actually the program that generates the the actual earth pressure and the calculation for it so you extract that from your results so now we're going to focus on the soil behavior during deep, deep excavations um, it's, it's going to take a lot of explaining so just bear with me and I'm going to try and take you through it step by step so now we'll briefly discuss some of the stress paths in soil during deep excavation in stiff clays as a plain strain problem so stress paths are expressed in terms of mean soil stress which is S or mean effective stress which is S dash and maximum divitoric stress which is T axis which is S and T are located at 45 degrees to sigma V and sigma H. Point A is located mid depth of point P at the bottom of the excavation. The difference between the two figures in terms of stress paths is due to poor water pressure. 
So a point A and P have different initial stress status due to their different stress history in terms of one dimensional loading, unloading and reloading. So in part two on the excavation significant reduction in lateral stress takes place. So ignoring the stress change in the vertical direction and under undrained conditions the new effective states will become A2 and P3. So that's shown on the actual diagram now. I'm just going to indicate that. So this is part of the the actual the excavation as you go down. Uh, part three, an excavation proceeds large reduction in vertical stress occurs at point P. So you see point P in the excavated area there, right in the centre. This is where it's going to be perfected the most. Assuming stress changes in the horizontal direction is negligible, that means the excavation, and under undrained conditions, so this is where we're in the, the top part of the actual chart, uh, the effective stress path will move vertically downwards with the generation of negative excess pore water pressure, so down towards the bottom part of the graph here, there. So part four, for long term, the total stress state for point P will not change much, but when the dissipation of excess pore water pressure takes place, effective stress path for P moves towards KF, which is the extension line. And this is the, the failure point. So failure may or may not occur depending on the soil shear strength or the change in the stress. So if it were to go past this point, then you'd create heaving and uh, the you get clay boiling, or what it's called in the industry. Uh, point uh, Part 5. Unlike point P, horizontal stress reduces significantly for point A as the excavation proceeds. So if undrained conditions are maintained, effective stress path A2 and A3 dash uh, will be vertical. The induced excess pore water pressure is negative as the excess pore water pressure dissipates. Effective stress path moves towards KF and the compression line so in essence this means that if it were to go to that line then you get major uh, compressions in the actual material depressions so just go through the numerical analysis for simple calculations uh, using adequate factors of safety to establish the stability so obviously your overturning moment if you're working with a gravity retaining wall then you want that gravity retaining wall to have uh, resist the overturning moment of the soil and the pore water pressure obviously this comes out a factor of 1.5 usually or higher uh, determining the bending moments for the assumed earth pressure and water uh, water pressure diagram so that triangle that comes down as the pressure increases down the back of the wall and that will be created uh, you do not take into account the relative stiffness of the soil and the structure because all you're dealing with is the actual the gravity of the structure itself the beam spring approach uh, which models the wall soil interaction but doesn't compute general ground movements it creates simpler computations but unrealistic soil behavior but the the finite element method, method uh, takes into account uh, the interaction between all of the components within the retaining system are part of the, com the computer system basically taken into every single material property and every cohesion between the material properties as well so if you've got different soil mechanics happening at the same time so continuous models to represent soil behavior so as I was just saying there the different soil behaviors that take place and the results output for wall behavior ground movements anchors and prop forces and the effects of surcharges can all be represented in one model and you can extract the results for every single part of that model as well. So just talking about the numerical analysis in the constitutive models in the Mohiculum model. So it simulates the shear failure, it, the use of equivalent linear stiffness for compaction or unloading behaviour which is the modulus of elasticity so, but you've only got one of those during the the original Mohiculum model. Um, it's useful to perform preliminary analysis, but obviously when you get to more complex tasks, then it struggles to do it. It does overestimate the heave in the bottom of an excavation, and it's unable to capture the loading and unloading behaviour, 
whereas the modified Merculum model which you can calculate the settlement analysis of foundations on soft, so soft soils this is because you have more in-depth modules of elasticity and different soil models uh, which is the application to soft and harder types of soil the distinction between the primary loading and the unloading and reloading of the soils can be incorporated into the modified vehiculum model which this is because I didn't really express it correctly but this is because of the different modules of elasticity of the different soil parameters you've got in place so it's going to change if it's saturated or unsaturated it's going to change if it's loaded or unloaded so the stress history of the soil can be calculated in the unloaded and loaded condition in the pre-consolidation stress and it creates a more realistic bottom heave and trough settlement behind the wall so when the, there's heave of the soil as we saw in the last in the last slide where you've got the two what we saw as sheet piles effectively if the soil is removed and it heaves then there is the potential for the wall to shift and create a trough at the back of the actual wall itself this is kind of like a it looks like a hogging moment basically at the back of the wall in the soil itself right so just continuing on the numerical analysis and talk about anchors and tiebacks uh, they're modelled as a 1D truss element so essentially what you do is you know the value is going to be unless you you can either test it on site or you can take it from the actual the website or wherever you've got the information on the the pull out behaviour and you can put that as a truss element in tension uh, and you can put that against the wall as in the support uh, it's designed for the actual loads uh, you've got the types as bonded and unbonded and most numerical analysis computer programs can actually give you a value for this or you give them a value and they'll check the stiffness and the pull out force uh, bonded anchors require full nodal behaviour so they're actually modelled as mesh elements going down through and the connectivity throughout the length of the anchor is also modelled um, through these links. The unbonded anchors require nodal connectivity at the start and end nodes with the soil mesh that means you can give them a value and if they're rock bolts then you can obviously give them a value or a fixity at the end. Um, the pre-stressing force can be applied as well which I explained at the start where you give it a tensile force. Uh, soil nails he models his truss elements again and these just create a kind of for your slip plane they can cut through them. Uh, nodal connectivity for soil mesh can be created uh, through the use of that mesh and the actual the nodal points. So he's going through struts and props. So their model is a 1D truss element. So if you can imagine a 1D truss element being propped up against here, supporting the bank or supporting the wall. Also, if you're holding apart an excavation, then you'd have them going in this direction. They're designed for the actual force. So that's the force coming over from the other side and the actual force acting on the element itself. Uh, as for walls, in 2D, they're for plane strain analysis, the model has a wall as a, as a beam, so this is a, a beam illustrated here, representing the wall. And soil is the, the plane strain on the element. And for 3D, for 3D analysis, model walls as plates, so you see the plates going all the way along the outside there and the soil is a volumetric element so that's around the outside so this is designed for the actual bending and the shear force effect and nodal connectivity is required so we can see all the nodes are actually becoming more condensed as they move towards the excavation right now I'm just going to drag the model across so now we're in the working space just want to show you uh, the actual materials material properties and show you uh, We've already had them actually built them up, save time, and uh, we just want to show you the model and actual the structural property. So here you have the the pipe, the H piles, and the anchors as well. You have a drop down menu. You can change the parameter types as well. So go back to geometry again. We just go to smart surface, and we just that's just created our smart surface for the full model, as you can see. Um, we just want to create our mesh sets as well and we can actually drag and drop the different materials over to the model so the soft rock 
let me just do this quickly Want the main focus to be on the uh, the analysis after so just hang on so it's going to take the the weathered soil across and as you can see each time I drag one across it changes from the the blue colour in the menu over to the black colour signifying that it is actually a soil layer so I'll just do the same with the property as well which is a structure element and there you go that's all of the layers quick and easily applied I'm just going to do the view the properties and view the different element properties as well so as you can see there and let's go back into the model and just carry out the smart mesh function where you can mesh all the use a very fine mesh you've got different types of mesh to deal with as you see all the mesh has been created I'll just look at the, the structural elements and we can make it we can create the, the free length and also the bonded length so just looking at those elements now so just gonna give it a name just so that's the, the free stress length so you actually say that's embedded and then we just select where the member is and it's the free length just click on that and now we do the second bit which is the bonded length Put that in. Okay. now we just hit the preview button now we do the same on the second one so just to give it a name Select from the drop down menu and click on the first edge and go down to the middle. So now just to move over and do the bonded length as well. Okay, now it's done, that's complete. So just the structural elements have been created. So now we we'll look at the, the tendons and we can give them the pre-stressed losses so tendon or pre-stressed losses in the tendon just give it a force we give it 220 and we just do that in the bonded length and the unbonded length so you see a preview there you go that's applied gives you a nice force with an arrow then we apply it to the other one as well Okay, there you go. Loss has been applied. Brilliant. Then we want to create the ground supports around the outside. So, going okay, up one side and the bottom and the other side. So it's now in place. So that's pretty quick and easy. Now we're going to create the boundary condition of the actual building or the structure. So we just need that to be. Uh, structure and it's going to be the concrete for the basement you just want to select that quickly there you go and then just call that structure and that's okay and that's giving it some ground conditions now so you'll have that soil structure interaction so for the the soil structure interaction you're going to create an interface element along the retaining wall and this will allow the uh, the soil to slip so it's created then links. Okay. Got a strength reduction factor. There we go. I'm just gonna select the wall. That's the wall selected. Okay. And those properties have been provided and you can see them in the works tree. So now that I've I've completed all those different objectives, just want to close this model. I'm not going to save that and bring over the fully analysed model with all the construction stages in, entwined into it, built into it. What I'm going to do is just show you the construction stages. So we just go through construction stage, initial stage with the house and everything there, and, and then we just go through the level excavation. So taking it down through the different levels. We're down to level three. Okay, so that are the construction stages being carried out. So now we're going to look at some of the uh, 
the post processing so we just want to look at different things so I just select a few little objectives here so we just look at the displacements and the horizontal displacement as you can see as it goes through the different stages as well we can flick through so just want to look at the deform shape and that is the deform shape as you can see as the soil is removed this is creating that buckling effect as it goes down then the stress is slightly reduced so just looking at level 1 again so now go look at the forces at the moments so just look at the the beam moments and that is the beam for the wall so you see those moments that are there I just want to tag these in a moment so we can look at different stages I just want to look at the just tag the results so we just give it a different colour as you see that is 1.7 uh, kilonewton meters acting against that part of the wall so I just want to tag one more result just to show you uh, the just to show you the worst case which will be the large spike at the top of the wall okay so just change the actual colour of that a minute so you can see it more accurately right so there you see 10 kilonewtons acting at that point of the wall and then as you move down there's 23 kilonewtons and further down so just showing you the quick tagging and what results you'll get out and what they mean So look at the embo in embedded truss, I just want to look at the actual forces acting on it. As you see here are the actual forces, so these are in kilonewtons meter. so I just want to show you those. You can look at those through in the different stages as well and when they start acting in the tensile stress. So now just looking at the effective stress, and we can look at those at the different stages as well. So you can see all the effective stress and we can look at the mess edges and where these meshes are acting and then you can see it change through the construction stages you can also tag results here as well so I'm just going to change the colour of that in a moment just give you a few more as well so that's uh, 123 kilonewtons per metre squared acting in that place and as you see as you go higher and higher up the wall then the values decrease so less stress at a higher level Okay, now we've, we've finished that section, so I'm just going to drag the, the model back across and we'll just close off the presentation and just talk about the comparison and the key points of the soil behaviour. So the Johazi and Beck 1967 and the Beck 1964 formula are used for the conventional approach and the constitutive models are used for the numerical approach. So for earth pressures, uh, the empirical formula is the input and for the constitutive model, which is the output in the numerical approach, in the excavation sequence or the construction stage analysis, which we were carrying out a minute ago, you can't consider it or it's not considered in the conventional approach and it can be considered in the numerical approach. Excessive excavation induced movement cannot be considered. This is all the stresses and the displacements that we can simulate realistically in the numerical model. And the settlement of soil relative to the support conditions are not possible, but they can be monitored through the interface of elements along supports in numerical analysis. And finally, for the design, uh, conservative and expensive but for numerical they become optimum or optimized okay so just moving on to finally why soil works so soil works offers CAD based drawing environment coupled with CAD file import and export options obviously as you could see from the user interface it's very easy and simple to use a very efficient way of doing things uh, it's a finite element analysis module, uh, so everything based in the space, so in all your meshes and everything like that, is a finite element for all the interaction. Coupled stress seepage analysis can be ca carried out within the modeling space, 
automatic mesh generation and practical reinforcements considered with a streamlined design process repetition eliminated with the parametric analysis that can be carried out so those are some of the really neat feature features within the program and you also get a automatic report at the end which you can generate which is got all your shortcuts and everything like that in it so thank you everybody thank you for listening and uh, it's been a good webinar good turnout so thank you everybody that's been involved and been in the room um, my name's been Adam Kane and as I always say we are on all the different media channels we've got Facebook LinkedIn Twitter Google Plus and we also upload content to YouTube for your learning and a future in uh, geotechnical engineering excellence so if you do wish to contact us then use the details on the screen and if you want to speak to me just ask Adam Kane and I would be happy to help uh, thank you and I look forward to speaking with you or seeing you soon <laughs>